Greetings and welcome back to Room 303 AP English and our conversation with the World of Ideas lectures. This is lecture number 11, King's, Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous letter from a Birmingham jail. Now, I, I, this without question, one of the more important of the texts that you will ever be asked to read in 303. I want to point out something, though, at the very beginning of this lecture, and I've already given a, a lecture at LearnStrong.net on, uh, on this uh, text, but I'm excited now to speak of it a second time. I have said for a long time in 303 that you're not born a patriot. You have to choose to be a patriot, and, 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 and if, you're, if you're not very patriotic, it's not your fault, by and large. It's, it's people like my fault that we've not given you good enough reason to really be patriotic, and I think you know, one of the powerful things about a text and the study of a text like this is that it can answer some of those fundamental questions about why, why should I be proud to be an American? I'll give you an answer. And the answer is because Martin Luther King Jr. wrote this document. It's amazing to me the number of students that will say, well, yeah, MLK is supposed to be like a famous guy, right? Because he like gave a speech or something like that about dreaming or something like that. No, no, no. It is true that the I Have a Dream speech is an important moment in American history, but I'm going to argue that an important moment in American rhetorical compositional history is in fact the very essay that we are about to pay attention to. And, interestingly, it is an epistolatory essay. By that we mean it's a letter. And it follows in a long tradition the epistles or letters of the of, of the great Saint Paul of the New Testament will come to mind. The thing about letters, and put this in your notes right away, the thing about letters is that they can be both informal and formal at the same time. And there's so many really famous uh, letters and epistles in the history of, uh, of composition. This is one of the most famous, and so we're going to study it from that perspective. Now again, some assumptions here. Uh, the first is that you're familiar with LearnStrong.net and you've been following our stuff, especially the World of Ideas lectures in the AP folder there, lectures 1 through 10, especially lecture 8 over Douglas uh, and the narrative of Frederick Douglass and the lecture number 9, the Thoreau lecture on civil disobedience. Those will be hypercritical because my assumption is that some of the things that we have been saying about justice, which is part of this Unit 2 of the Jacobists, text world of ideas, that you, you're in possession of those ideas. The other uh, assumption is that you've already followed my lecture on Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, letter from a Birmingham jail. I've already given a previous lecture. It's provided for you there at LearnStrong.net. You can always find it as well on LearnStrong.net through the search engine. And that's, a, that's an assumption of mine as well. The other assumptions, of course, are learning theory, that desire to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways. We do that through our active reading called annotation, the answering of three guiding questions, level one, what does the text say? Remember that we are asking of you that you do a paragraph summary of each of the paragraphs, summarize two or three things you want to remember, paraphrasing and the like at level one. At level two, we ask, what does the text mean? at 2A themes, messages, and our big five. That is to say, what does this text say about epistemology and what you can know? What does this text say about ontology and who we are? What does this text say about psychology, the workings of the individual mind? What does this text say about sociology, the workings of groups of minds together in some political understanding? And then finally, the question of theodicy. Why is it that bad things seem to happen? Here he is, sitting in a jail cell. Reminiscent of St. Paul, reminiscent of Gandhi, reminiscent, of course, of Thoreau, who both Gandhi and Thoreau we mentioned in the, last, in the last lecture on Thoreau's civil disobedience. And he could have felt sorry for himself. He could have gotten deeply angered and, you know, led to some kind of nasty hate. But no, what he does is he sits down and he writes a beautifully crafted letter that we'll want to talk about in terms of, uh, you know, the rhetorical techniques here in a bit. The uh, third part of our, of our reading annotative process is, of course, to ask the question, how can I relate to this in some meaningful way? First, relating to other texts that we've studied or other texts we've been exposed to. It is an amazing thing, and I don't think this is hyperbole as I say this. This letter, this essay that is a letter, will assume amazingly almost everything we've studied in AP. It's quite remarkable. 
as you pick this essay up, this letter up, we'll be pointing out all the different allusions, references to other kinds of thinkers and texts. It's a remarkable thing. At 3A, we'll mess around with that. And then finally, at 3B, don't just take my word for it, as I've often said. You don't become a patriot by just believing or mouthing some kind of words of people you respect. Rather, I hope that you will be able to relate to this text in some meaningful way yourself. And finally, our last assumption, of course, is that you read this material on your own before you come to me for some guidance. And, and, and again, challenging yourself to grow as, as a reader, as a writer, as a thinker. That's uh, the assumption in the end. Let's do some real quick biography. Uh, in my earlier lecture, I did more of this, so I'm just going to hit the high points. The dates, 1929 born, 1968 tragically, of course, assassinated. He is an ordained minister. He gets his doctorate in theology at Boston University. That's hypercritical to the reading of this essay, as I say in my earlier lecture, because King could have easily written over the heads of any number of his possible readers. He chose not to do that. It's quite a, quite a remarkable thing because he was so well educated, and yet he was able to speak directly to the heart of the matter and use word pictures that anyone can understand and resonate with. He, of course, is that great civil rights leader of 15 or more years. He's arrested several times, like Thoreau ends up in jail, willing to suffer for his views. A great believer in nonviolent resistance. In that classic essay that we study of King in the junior year, you'll maybe recall that opening line, oppressed peoples respond to oppression in three characteristic ways. The first of those three ways, acquiescence, to just give up and say, go ahead and hit me some more. But King's argument is that acquiescence allows for there not to be the proper amount of love shown to the one doing the oppressing, because ultimately the oppressor will start to believe that he or she is right in oppressing, and therefore acquiescence, he says, is not the way. If you love the one who is slapping you across the face, you can't let that one slapping you across the face continue to do so out of love for that person, because you allow their conscience to slumber, he says. Of course, the opposite answer is, of how one responds to oppression, Corroding violence and hatred. He quotes Gandhi, an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. This notion that if the response is simply violence, it will lead to hatred, and therefore you cannot have community. And then he will introduce his third point. And the way he does it, you'll recall, is that he says, like the synthesis in Hegelian philosophy, and of course we know our Hegel, and so we know that what he's talking about is you have a thesis, that A. You have its complete opposite, antithesis, the B. And they come together and struggle, dialectic. And in the process of that dialectic, produce a C, synthesis. And of course, here we will meet King's brilliant idea, borrowed in large measure from Gandhi, and of course, to some degree, Thoreau. And that is, we're going to take a little bit of the idea that one should not fight in violent ways, acquiescence, we're going to take from the other side that notion that one should struggle against injustice, and we're going to bring them together in what he calls non-violent resistance. We're going to hear something about that again in this essay as well. And one of the reasons why King, I think, had to articulate this to especially his audience, who we will get to as white ministers who are not supporting his actions, is that he wants it to be clear that he believes in struggle, but he believes in non-violent struggle as a means to accomplish. He wins the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964, and of course, tragically, on the 4th of April, 1968, he is assassinated at the Lorraine Hotel in Memphis, Tennessee. One of those tragic, truly tragic moments in American history. Now, we turn to the rhetorical techniques, and of course, I've mentioned this in the earlier lecture, and for those of you who were a part of that discussion with me, or you've recently watched that discussion again to review on LearnStrong.net, Let's remind ourselves of some of the rhetorical techniques that Jacobus will be emphasizing. Of course, the allusions are important, and especially references to the biblical text. As we have often said in 303, you, if you are going to be literate, and you are going to be, in my estimation, a citizen of the United States, you have to know biblical text. Whether you are a practicing religious person or not is beside the point. You need to know the text for all of the allusions that are going to be made 
in this life in, in, and in this piece. And of course, as we mentioned, St. Paul's epistles are a part of this. Part of that, of course, is that St. Paul wrote a number of his epistles from prison, especially in Rome. And to that degree, King is in some ways emulating the earlier uh, St. Paul. We'll see as well an emphasis on justice and brotherhood in this text. And one of the ways that happens is, is the tone is patient. I would put that in my notes. Patient with his critics, who are white clergymen, who have argued, you are upsetting, Mr. King, you are upsetting society by doing this. Of course, King being called all kinds of terrible names, as being a, you know, a, an, an unsettler of the peace. Right. And King here wants to win these individual readers over through the writing of this document. And his method then is powerful and careful reasoning. I'm just with you in the last paragraph of Jacobus in his introduction to rhetorical techniques on 153. Just read it with me. His method, King's method, is that of careful reasoning, focusing on the substance of their criticisms, these white clergymen, particularly on their complaints that his actions were, quote, unwise and untimely, as we'll read in a moment in paragraph one. King takes each of these charges in turn, carefully analyzes it against his position, then follows with the clearest possible statement of his own views and why he feels they, were, they are worth adhering to. The letter from Birmingham jail is a model then of close and reasonable analysis of a very complex situation. That is hypercritical. If you're going to become a good writer, as we've said, you've got to be a good reader. And one of the first things about being a good reader at level 2B is to analyze rhetorical techniques. Go back and one more time pay attention. A model of close and reasonable analysis of a very complex situation. It succeeds largely because it remains concrete, treating one issue after another carefully, refusing to be caught up in passion or posturing. Go back to our comments on Frederick Douglass and the narrative. Notice not overly sentimental. In other words, you're not going to hear King say things like, can you believe what these people are doing to us and how terrible it is and we should have all of these emotional responses. He stays away from this kind of emotion. And to that degree, he's then going to be able to be understood as logical. Above all, just to finish, King remains grounded in logic. We would think immediately of our comments about Aristotle convinced that his arguments will in turn convince his audience. Now, the irony of all ironies is, we're at 2B as we're talking about this, so we can mention this now, is that, of course, King's going to use the logic of Aristotle, who, of course, many years prior had argued for the legitimacy of slavery. We talked about that in our comments on Frederick Douglass, and here we're going to be playing a very similar kind of game. Let's go now to a level one summary. Let's work, I've already done this in some, in some ways already online, and in fact, I believe that we had it read aloud for you there. But I want to work through this again, and I want to start with these opening lines on page 153. The way you begin your essay is always hypercritical. We've talked about the importance of the introduction. Let's look at it now as it relates specifically to how King sets this up. My dear fellow clergymen, by the way, again, just like we've said in earlier lectures, pay attention to these footnotes. Notice who is in fact listed here. These, are, these notes are going to be hypercritical for your study. While confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling my present activities, quote, unwise and untimely, end quote. Seldom do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. If I sought to answer all the criticisms that crossed my desk, my secretaries would have little time for anything other than such correspondence in the course of the day, and I would have no time for constructive work. But, then again, notice our conceding of a point. He says, normally you don't try to respond to all the criticism because you don't have time. What did we say in our comments about the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson's classic, when you concede a point, you say something the acrimonious audience would normally agree with. That's the audience that doesn't agree with you normally. And then you always follow it up with the word but. Here's the word but. But, since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill, notice the brilliance, by the way, of this, and that your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I want to try to answer your statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. Notice the genius of this, of this beginning. He doesn't come out immediately and say, you're all a bunch of racists and I can't stand the position that you're taking. No, no, no. It begins with love. And if there's anything that makes King 
make you stand up and be proud of your country. It is this realization that no matter how upset you are, you begin to solve a problem not from bellicosity, not from animosity, but rather from love. A genuine belief, even though it may be misinformed, that the ones that you're trying to dis discuss with, maybe debate with, you, you can find some middle ground of love. What a compelling idea. Brilliant. Let's work quickly. Paragraphs one through four. While here in jail, he says, I read your statement as we just read. I came here in the request of our Southern Christian Leadership Conference, he says, affiliated in Birmingham. More basically, he says, I came to carry the gospel of freedom. Notice the brilliance of that, the gospel of freedom. Injustice is here, and injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, one of the famous ideas. In other words, back to Thoreau, we have to be willing as citizens to love our country, but to stand up against injustice. This is the, notice, important harmony, balance that he's seeking. In paragraphs 5 through 9, he says you deplore the demonstrations here, but not the conditions that cause them. Any nonviolent campaign has, he says, four basic steps. They are collecting facts, negotiation, self-purification, and direct action. On page 155, this is paragraph 6, he will say it this way. In any nonviolent campaign, there are four basic steps. Collection of the facts to determine whether injustices exist. Negotiation. Then self-purification. And then finally, direct, act, direct action. And then notice that he will go through this. In paragraph 6, he will talk about step 1. In paragraph 7, he will talk about self two, uh, step, step 2 and the negotiation process. And then in paragraph 8 and 9 and following, he will talk about how self-purification, in other words, making sure that your actions are rooted out of love and not out of some kind of corroding hatred. Finally, direct action. And that's the key. The, work, the, the key is direct action. We will do something that makes sure everyone understands what it is that's the point of this work. He says, we have done this. We negotiated, we won promises that have been broken, we prepared for action with self-purification, a series of workshops on nonviolence, then we planned our action. Paragraphs 10 through 11, he says, you call for negotiations, so do we. The purpose, he says, of direct action is to dramatize the issue so that it can no longer be ignored. We're here, he says, to create the constructive, nonviolent tension necessary for growth. I'll just jump to paragraph number 10. You may well ask. Notice how he does this kind of rhetorical questioning. Why direct action? Why sit-ins, marches, and so forth? Isn't negotiation a better path? You're quite right in calling for negotiation indeed. This is the very purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and fosters such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks so to dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. But my citing the creation of tension as part of the work of the nonviolent resistor may sound rather shocking, but Again, conceding a point, following with that with that uh, conjunction, but but I must confess, I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly opposed the violent tension, but there is a type of constructive nonviolent tension which is necessary for growth, just as Socrates. Notice our referencing here. Notice as we said in AP long ago, everything seems to come back to Plato. Just as Socrates, you'll remember, spent a little time in a jail cell, that's the Crito, and then of course executed, that's the Phaedo. Of course the Apology Lecture as well, all of those lectures available, go back and take a look at learnstrong.net. As Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension in the mind, so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and half-truths to the unfettered realm of, cre of creative analysis and objective appraisal, so must we see the need for nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society that will help men rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. Real quick observation at 3A. Do you remember what we said about Homeric similes, beginning with that word like or as, and then that word so to make sure that we qualify? You have an epic simile here that is, in fact, brilliant. 
In other words, we got to wake people up the way Socrates was that gadfly, he said, that he woke people up. Go back to our comments on, on Plato's Apology. And he says, that is exactly what we're doing here. Paragraphs 12 through 14, you ask, he says, why not give the new city administration time to act? No administration here will act unless prodded. Freedom will not be offered voluntarily by the oppressor, but must be demanded by the oppressed. This will be that argument that force is not going, and power is not going to be given up voluntarily, usually, right? And, th and therefore, wait has almost always meant never, and given the lynchings, beatings, poverty, cruelty, degradation that we suffer, he says, we can't afford to wait. Paragraphs 15 through 22, the heart of the argument. You deplore our willingness to break laws. This is, of course, the question of justice and the correct application of laws. Though we urge people to obey just laws, we have a moral responsibility to disobey any law that conflicts with the law of God. We're back again to Sophocles and the classic text, Antigone. Go back and look at our comments there. There are, Antigone argues, there are higher laws that I must apply to myself in the burial of my brother. Segregation is not only politically, economically, socially unsound, it's morally wrong, he argues in paragraphs 15 through 22, and, of course, sinful. Our civil disobedience, sounding very much like Thoreau, shows respect for law and is part of the great Christian and the American traditions. Paragraphs 23 through 24, he says, I have almost concluded that white moderates, not rabid seg segregationists, are our greatest stumbling block. Those who value order over justice prefer reducing tension to achieving peace agree with our goals, but reproach our methods, and believe they can set a timetable for our freedom. I had hoped you would understand that tension must be released to be alleviated, and that injustice must be exposed 